all sport is competition, whether it's against oneself or against an opponent, sport has always been the pursuit of physical excellence. Competition and the need to test one's physical capabilities has been an inherent part of human nature. Our competitive nature gives rise to a universal concept that exists in all cultures around the globe, sport. Sport attracts a certain type of individual that has the competitive spirit and the desire to test themselves against others. These insane men and women who put themselves through physical pain to improve themselves have always needed someone to guide them along the way. A watchman, so to speak. The watchman must possess many qualities, calmness, organisation, patience and a knowledge of the sport. However, the most important quality they must possess is predicting the future. Sporting competition happens usually on a yearly or quadrennial basis. It is at this time the athletes need to be at their physical best. The biggest problem, for the watchman at least, is the planning and the preparation leading up to this one event in the future and knowing exactly where their athlete needs to be physically and what they will achieve on that day. Schedules must be met and all the variables needed in order to succeed must be in place. And all of this needs to be foreseen one year or four years in advance. So how is this ungodly like task of predicting the future done? Well, it's done for a practice called periodization. Put simply, periodization is the systematic planning of athletic or physical training. The aim is to reach the best possible performance in the most important competition of the year. The process of periodization is a detailed and complex one. It's not done through blind luck or guesswork, but by having a good knowledge of the fundamental principles of the physical quality of performance. But what are the origins of these principles? How do we discover them, and how do we understand them in order to form what we now call periodization? To answer that specific question, we must go further afield, outside the realms of sport, and into the world of disease theory. At the University of Montreal back in 1936, a physician named Hans Zelle made an important discovery that kicked off an entire field of study in the sporting world. He noticed that all of his patients shared common symptoms despite having different conditions. He noticed that high temperature, muscle soreness and fatigue were commonplace. However, conventional wisdom at the time dictated that if the symptom did not help diagnose a disease, it was brushed aside as a byproduct of the patient just being sick. Sele, however, was fascinated with the process of just being sick. He wanted to know what happened to the body when it got sick. In his book, The Stress of Life, Sele talks about his fascination with this concept. Surely, if it is important to find the remedies which help against one disease or another, it would be even more important to learn something about the mechanisms of being sick and the means of treating this general syndrome of sickness. His fascination into what he called the general syndrome of being sick formed what would be known as general adaptation syndrome. General adaptation syndrome describes what happens to the body when it's under stress. It's made up of three distinctive stages. Once the body is exposed to stress, the first stage begins the alarm stage. This is when the body reacts to the stress. Here the heart rate goes up and cortisol levels increase. The body is now in a state of decline. After this comes the resistance stage. Now the body starts to fight back. The heart rate returns to normal and cortisol levels decrease. At this point however the stressor has gone but the body fights on, creating a heightened state of readiness. However if the body fails to fight off this stressor then the final stage begins, the exhaustion stage. Here the body's resources to fight stress have been exhausted. If this continues then only one thing is left for the body, death. 30 years after Sele's discovery into general adaptation syndrome, the concept started to gain popularity among Soviet sports scientists. There was however a lot of debate regarding its effectiveness into the planning of sports performance. The main issue being the final stage, the stage of exhaustion, and how we can ultimately avoid it. From this problem came the first ever model of periodization, supercompensation theory. Supercompensation theory acts on the principle that the training load is the stressor, and therefore it can be controlled. By periodically increasing and decreasing training loads over time, the body can overcome it and adapt to it. By doing this on a weekly and monthly basis, the body can reach a higher level of homeostasis and soon the stressor's effect on the body will be diminished. This model however is not without its flaws. Over the course of the 21st century, many other models of periodization were created, some of them as a direct result of the criticisms of supercompensation theory. Nevertheless, the field of periodization has been one of the biggest breakthroughs in the field of sports science. Some of the greatest sporting achievements of all time can be put down to the practice of good periodization. It's not a stretch, however, to say that none of this would have been possible without the work of an Austro-Hungarian physician named Hans Zelle.